welcome to this reflection on mission. Missiology, the study of mission. One associates the word mission with maybe a person or a group of people being sent forth to achieve some objective. Maybe the mission is associated with a journey. One calls to mind the story of Jason and the Argonauts and their quest to find the Golden Fleece. Or Frodo Baggins' journey to Mordor to throw the One Ring into the cracks of Mount Doom. And those of us who are familiar with the Hebrew and Christian scriptures are familiar with the narratives of Moses and Jesus and the Apostles, all called to missionary activity. In Exodus, God says to Moses, So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And Jesus, after his wilderness experience, proclaims, Get ready, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then Jesus dedicates his life to proclaiming and manifesting God's kingdom, a journey that leads to the cross. And then the apostles are commissioned by the risen Christ in Matthew's gospel like this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. These then are the words and images that we mostly associate with missology and the mission of the church. But as we contemplate mission, let's take a broader view, a view that embraces the idea that the church doesn't have a mission, the mission has a church, and that this word mission is referring to the very activity that we associate with this mystery we call God, an activity of love that draws all things towards completeness, a mission that has been active since the beginning of time. If we step back from the Judeo-Christian narratives, we see a whole world of peoples and cultures, each with their own treasured narratives, each wrestling with the great existential questions. And if we step back even further, we see a whole cosmos with its own narrative that is 13.8 billion years old. We are each blessed with extraordinary sensory awareness that allows us to experience the world around us with wonder and gratitude and a yearning to seek the truth about all that is. To be creative, to be imaginative, to ask questions about our origins and destiny, to aspire towards goodness and to appreciate beauty. Moreover, we possess, at our noblest, a capacity for love that transcends the states of entropy inherent in our universe. Entropy is the law of physics that says all things move from an ordered state towards a more disordered state. For example, an ice cube at room temperature melts into water and the water evaporates and is dispersed into the atmosphere. A sandcastle on a beach is subject to the weather and its ordered form will break down and scatter into individual grains of sand. Even a steel rod will in time rust and break down into its elemental parts. And of course, the human condition is subject to entropy. A fit and healthy body will in time give way to old age. A brilliant mind surrenders to dementia. A beautiful and vigorous child is brought low by cancer. And we see around us all too often moral and social entropy. And we are very aware of the harm to our planet caused by environmental degradation. So it would seem that this word 
entropy is the saddest of words. And yet, yet without it, without entropy and the adversities it creates, one speculates whether love transcendent can exist. For how can there be mercy? How can there be compassion? How can there be forgiveness? How can there be gratitude without life's adversities? An aged parent with dementia creates a situation for transcendent love to occur in the care and the commitment shown to them. The child brought low by cancer manifests a love measured in grief and sorrow, but also a determination by medical professionals to search for a cure so that such grief and sorrow can be negated in the future. And out of the rubble caused by bigotry, ignorance and intolerance, prophets for truth, human dignity, and justice rise. And a planet suffering the ravages of climate change is stirring the hearts of responsible people and activists towards finding sustainable solutions to address the climate crisis. One has to contemplate where does transcendent love come from? What is its source? I am reminded of a book by Khalil Gibran called The Prophet. In this book, the prophet is departing from the community that loves him, but the people seek his wisdom before his departure and ask him to expound on certain topics. One woman says, Speak to us of children. And the prophet says, Your children are not your own. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. What a wonderful phrase, life's longing for itself. And the prophet imagines God as the great archer. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. Let's stay with that metaphor. Imagine the source of all things as an archer, an archer who lets loose the arrow of time. And that arrow is on mission because written on its shaft is life, self-aware life. And we know that arrow has brushed up against at least one planet in the cosmos because here we are. We are indeed wonderfully made, as the psalmist tells us. Never, ever should we allow ourselves to think, even for a moment, that we are insignificant. I praise you.
When I was fashioned in secret And molded in the depths of the earth I praise you, I thank you For I am wonderfully made Even those things that are not self-aware and seemingly inanimate and insensate are on mission. I'm reminded of a quote from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, in which a character says to an ignorant mob, You blocks, you stones, you worse than senseless things. But consider this, all things that exist, even blocks and stones, create. Blocks and stones erode to form soil. Soil enriched with phosphorus, nitrogen and potassium and other nutrients promote the growth of plants. In the same way, atoms and cells may not comprehend they create our bodies, but they're drawn to do so. They are on mission. All things are drawn to create this wonderful symphony of being we call the cosmos. Nothing is static. All things are on a journey towards fullness of being. And in the Judeo-Christian heritage, we call the source of this activity God. Or in the book of Exodus, in Hebrew scripture, I am. And it is the great I am that we direct the cries of the human heart. When our hearts are stirred by the wonders and delights we see around us, we cry, Oh my God! And when our hearts are challenged by great adversity, we cry, God help me! When our hearts are filled with profound gratitude, for all that is good and beautiful in our world, we cry, thank God. And when our hearts are filled with remorse for our moral failings, we cry, God forgive me. We lift our hearts to the great I am, to the author of all that is. This wondrous overflowing of life and love Is the song of the great I Am Have we the ears to hear The words of the song The caress of a gentle breeze The colours of each day Every breath we draw It's the song of infinite being We lift our hearts to the great I Am to the author of all that is This wondrous overflowing of life and love Is the song of the great I Am Have we the ears to hear The call of the song that draws all To fullness of life Let us rouse ourselves Let us heed the call Let us sing with all our might we lift our hearts to the great I Am To the author of all that is This wondrous overflowing of life and love Is the song of the great I Am Have we the ears to hear and surrender to the song To be one in the rhythm and the flow To be born along a trusting child in faith, in hope, in love. We lift our hearts to the great I am, to the author of all that is. This wondrous overflowing of life and love is the song of the great I am. 
It's the song of the great I am. A great sadness for my wife and myself during the coronavirus pandemic was the physical distancing that occurred within our family. Our son, daughter-in-law and grandchild live in Canada. Because of travel restrictions, we had been unable to be in the company of our first and only grandchild during the first year of his life. We were missing out on all those wonderful milestones that grandparents get such a buzz out of witnessing. However, in this wonderful age of global communications, we were able to be vicariously present through the technologies available to us through our smartphones. Almost daily, we were sent photos and videos of our grandchild. And I remember one video that we watched with delight. It shows my daughter-in-law Sharon lying face down on her tummy on the floor with her arms outstretched before her. Some metres away is my grandson, similarly on his tummy, looking with glee and excitement towards his mum. You can see she is encouraging him to crawl and later in life she will encourage him to walk, to learn, to be self-sufficient. My grandson is on a journey towards completeness, fullness of life. He's on mission, but he can't do it by himself. He needs the overflowing love of his parents, caring and nurturing him. And it occurred to me that this video is showing the very essence of the activity we associate with the mystery we call God, the very essence of mission. And it brings to mind the words Jesus utters in John's Gospel. I have come that they may have life, life in all its fullness. Jesus' mission statement. And it is fully evident in this video. There's a circular dynamic happening here. The author of love, the mother, we can call the lover. The overflow of love the child, is the beloved. And the back and forth dynamic of joy, care and nurture that exists between the two, the spirit of love. As a diagram, it might look like this. Here is another image with the same dynamic. It's a painting by Gustav Klimt. One sees the lover, parental love, one sees the overflow of that love, the child, and one sees the joy, the fierce protectiveness, the bliss, the unity, the oneness, the relationship of love. It's a dynamic that is evident in Hebrew scripture, the story of Exodus. God, the author of life, draws his children from a diminished state of being, slavery in Egypt, towards a more transcendent place of moral, physical and spiritual fullness. And Jesus, portrayed as the new and greater Moses in Matthew's Gospel, proclaims God's kingdom available to all, especially those whose lives are diminished and wounded. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. A love transcendent is active in Jesus. A love that rises above physical, spiritual, and moral entropy. Those who were the intimates of Jesus saw in him divine expression divine activity, an outpouring of love transcended, animated by God's Spirit. The Trinitarian dynamic is imaged in the narrative describing Jesus' baptism. As soon as Jesus was baptised, he went up out of the water. Suddenly, 
the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and resting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It's a dynamic of loving relationship, and we are not excluded from this dynamic. We are always invited to be participants in divine activity. This is my son, this is my son This is my own dear son On whom my spirit rests My own, my beloved one A father's pride I have in him Pride in my own Dear Son, on whom my spirit rests, my own, my beloved one, I pray you open your heart, welcome him with joy, I pray you open your heart, welcome him with joy. My son, this is my son. This is my son. This is my own dear son, on whom my spirit rests. My own, my beloved one. A father's pride I have in him. A father's pride in my own dear son. On whom my spirit rests, my own, my beloved one. I pray you listen to him, his word is truth and light. I pray you listen to him, his word is truth and light. This is my son, this is my son. This is my son. This is my own dear son, on whom my spirit rests, my own, my beloved one. A father's pride I have in him. A father's pride in my own dear son. My spirit rests, my own, my beloved one, my beloved one, my beloved one. Saint Paul says that in God we live and move and have our being. If God is in all things, and all things are in God, then our minds and hearts are open to the idea that we can be participants in divine activity. We can choose to be in communion with that dynamic that we hold to be God. God is the lover, the beloved, and the spirit of love that dynamically interacts. If we have the eyes of the mystic, we can see that the whole cosmos is on a mission of love. And of course, we share in that mission. For to create life, to sustain life, to be an outpouring of life and love, is to be in communion with this mystery we call God. And the Church has a name for that communion. It's called salvation. In a decree on the mission activity of the Church, from the Second Vatican Council, we read, Salvation is humans coming to share in the Trinitarian Communion. And in another encyclical on mission, we read, The ultimate purpose of mission is to enable people to share in the communion which exists between the Father and the Son. 
And as teachers and support staff, we are at the cutting edge of this dynamic. If one were to ask, what is the most important attribute a teacher needs to be a teacher? Some might say infinite patience. Another might say creativity. Another might say organizational skills. All these are necessary attributes. But I think we can say that the most important prerequisite for being a teacher, one has to love children. To love the children in our care. And what is love? St. Thomas Aquinas says, Love is a desire to seek the good of the other, no matter who the other is. As teachers and support staff, we are critically involved in bringing each student in our care towards wholeness. A whole person, emotionally, aesthetically, intellectually, socially, morally and physically. Being a teacher, therefore, is among the noblest of professions. Every time a teacher steps into a classroom, they are in communion with the mission of God that brings all towards completeness. To conclude, the great awakening in the cosmic narrative for us who profess to be Christians is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and the hope, faith, and love that it proclaims and manifests. St. Paul famously says, the whole of creation has been groaning in labour pains, groaning for 13.8 billion years until now. Will keep our planet safe for each miracle.